everyone. I'm Dr. Teresa Rajak Kali, Vice Provost of Equity and Inclusion at Dalhousie University. I'm pleased to welcome you to Dalhousie University's Open Dialogue Live Series and into my home and yours. I would first like to begin by acknowledging that Dalhousie is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, and we are all treaty people. Under the current circumstances, being at home, we must find new ways to stay connected. This series enables us to bring weekly conversations to our community by our community, featuring some of Dalhousie's experts and focused on current events. Needless to say, what could be more current and what preoccupies our attention than what is happening globally and locally with COVID-19? This time I would like to also extend our condolences to victims of COVID-19 and their families, many of whom globally are from vulnerable communities. Today's episode focuses on the vulnerable communities here in Nova Scotia, communities that are often neglected and negatively stereotyped. Vulnerable populations are disproportionately affected economically, socially, and politically. But when there's a crisis such as the coronavirus pandemic, existing disparities are exacerbated. Today, our three panelists in this series will talk about how does COVID-19 impact vulnerable communities here in Nova Scotia. They will offer their expertise and knowledge to explore the situation in the Black communities here persons living with disabilities, and homeless individuals. The conversation will also examine why a human rights response to the COVID-19 crisis is necessary and imperative. So let's get started. Grab your favorite cup of tea or coffee and be prepared to a very enlightened conversation. Please be patient if there's some technological issues, but I am sure by now we are all used to that. Let me introduce our panelists. We have Alex Neve, who graduated from Dalhousie with a law degree and is currently the Secretary General at Amnesty International Canada. Dr. Judy McNonnell, a professor and director in Dalhousie School of Social Work and Assistant Dean of Equity and Inclusion in the Faculty of Health. Dr. Ingrid Waldron is an Associate Professor in Dalhousie School of Nursing and Director of the Environmental Noxiousness, Racial Inequities and Community Health Project, known as ENRICH. Unfortunately, our fourth panelist, Diana Devlin, who also graduated from Dalhousie and who's the Executive Director of Welcome Housing and Support Services, is unable to join us as planned today. However, this gives us a little more time for our panelists and for you to ask your questions. So during the presentations, we encourage you, our viewers, to post your questions online. A little later in our program, we will relay some of these questions to our presenters. So now I'd like to ask Alex to start us off and discuss the impact of COVID-19 on vulnerable populations the findings from a co-authored report he recently completed. Alex, the, walk in, the talking stick is now with you. Uh, thank you uh, so much for the introduction, Dr. Uh, Ray Jack Tali, and, and for this opportunity. And it's, and it's an honor to be able to share this space with uh, Judy and Ingrid. Um, I'm joining from Ottawa today, so I would like to begin with my own acknowledgement that, that I am participating in the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people, uh, and it's uh, certainly an honour to be joining you um, from, uh, from this land and territory. Uh, so I'm going to begin uh, with some overarching uh, reflections about uh, why a human rights approach and analysis uh, is very important to the response to the COVID crisis, and in particular, um, its very direct relevance to the question we're focusing on today, and, and that is vulnerable communities. Uh, and, you know, in these past several weeks, um, sometimes I, I have heard a bit of pushback or doubt when, when Amnesty and other human rights organizations and experts have shown up to say COVID crisis, let's make it all about human rights, because people kind of scratch their head and say, well, it's a public health emergency, it's an economic crisis, 
It's not really a human rights uh, concern, is it? Uh, but obviously everything uh, about this situation, absolutely everything, uh, is entirely about human rights. The virus itself, the economic collapse, uh, certainly the impact on the most marginalized and vulnerable communities, uh, the ways in which a lot of existing human rights violations are exacerbated uh, and made worse, and certainly the question of what kinds of restrictions uh, are or are not permissible on other rights. And that's why so many human rights organizations like Amnesty uh, have offered principles and guidance. Human rights commissions, including the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission, um, have provided their guidance to governments. UN human rights experts have, etc. This is all about human rights. Uh, the next slide, please. Certainly one key dimension of that is, is what we've referred to as, as the human rights do's. Uh, human rights protections aren't only about what can't happen. Uh, very often, very importantly, it's about what needs to happen, the proactive measures that are needed to, to occur. And, and, and here you see the obvious human rights issues that are so central to how this is playing out. The right to health and life, to livelihood, social security, housing, food and water, and the necessity that governments are taking proactive measures in all of those areas. And importantly, we absolutely have to keep in mind that this is not only about the domestic context, which is of course incredibly preoccupying for us um, in our communities right across the country, but this is global. Um, and, and there is a human rights obligation on all governments, including Canada, therefore to be thinking globally and ensuring that a, a cooperative international approach uh, is the hallmark of how we respond. Uh, the next slide, please. Of course, the, the corollary to human rights do's is human rights don'ts. Uh, and, and these are some of the things that are absolutely vital to ensure that governments refrain from doing uh, to avoid human rights violations, or at least to minimize human rights violations. So here we have the, and this may be actions that aren't committed by governments, but governments need to respond to do something about it. So we've seen an upsurge in racism, uh, in particular uh, against East Asian and, and Chinese communities right across Canada. Uh, and around the world, uh, stigmatized and scapegoated um, as the COVID crisis has unfolded, a rise, very serious concern about a rise of domestic violence um, in, in homes, uh, women and children in particular, some staggering statistics earlier this week from the government, suggesting that there's been a spike of between 20 to 30% in domestic violence across the country. Um, and the need to be very attentive to human rights concerns in places like prisons and detention centers within refugee policy, et cetera. Next slide, please. Uh, in many respects, perhaps the most important contribution uh, that a human rights analysis brings uh, to something like the COVID crisis goes to the very heart of our particular theme today. And that is human rights is all about ensuring that no one, no community is going to be left behind. And that comes from, of course, from the fact that, that the human rights uh, framework is universal, all rights for all people, uh, no matter what. And at a minimum, that of course has to mean that there can be no discrimination, no racism, no sexism in the programs and measures that are being adopted and rolled out, which of course has been happening at a dizzying rate over these last several weeks. Uh, but perhaps more fundamentally, what this recognizes is that groups that are marginalized and already experiencing serious uh, and in many instances, deeply entrenched human rights violations going back decades, uh, require extra or particular attention and responses because of that marginalization, uh, which, uh, which means that they are often overlooked, um, but also that they may face heightened vulnerability. You know, we know the linkage between vulnerability, the social determinants of health, and thus susceptibility uh, to something like the COVID crisis, but also the fact that the economic crisis is going to have greater, um, very, um, very differential impact. So here we're certainly in a Canadian context, very attentive to issues facing Indigenous communities, racialized communities, um, including the Black community uh, in Nova Scotia and elsewhere in the country. Uh, certainly it's been very clear that there's a very troubling disproportionate impact on the elderly. Uh, but other issues too, uh, women and gender, um, uh, people living with disabilities, uh, refugee and migrant communities. Next slide, please. Uh, the last piece of, of, of why uh, uh, human rights analysis is, is so important is this one. Uh, as we've all 
uh, observed and, of course, experienced the, the measures that governments are pursuing uh, necessarily, inevitably, and very understandably have included a whole variety of policies and programs, uh, enforcement uh, that limits and restricts other rights. Classes have been suspended, thus the right to education uh, is undermined. Businesses uh, have been forced to close, thus livelihood issues, um, which is a right, uh, the right to earn a livelihood and be able to support yourself uh, have been impinged. And obviously uh, with all of the, the border bans and requirements that, that people stay home and not gather in large crowds, huge um, restrictions on the freedom of movement, freedom of assembly, which are, which are absolutely Absolutely vital human rights, which groups like Amnesty vigorously defend uh, uh, in many, many instances. I think there's an assumption that human rights advocates will oppose all of that. And I think it's important to recognize that isn't the case because the human rights system, uh, international human rights treaties themselves, absolutely recognize uh, that it is not only uh, permissible, but may be a requirement uh, that governments um, take steps when faced with a, with a big crisis and emergency such as this uh, that will lead to restrictions on other rights. But you'll see here in this slide, the reminder that that is not a carte blanche at all, and that there's a number of restrictions on the ability of governments to restrict uh, other rights. Perhaps first and foremost, and again, very relevant to our topic uh, around vulnerable communities, that those restrictions cannot in any way, shape or form uh, be marked either directly or indirectly by discrimination. Uh, so certainly they can't be intentionally applied discriminatorily to one community and not to another, uh, but that governments need to very much be looking for the differential discriminatory impact, even if unintended, um, across different communities. Uh, next slide. It's one thing, I guess, to, to talk about these principles and you know, highlight all of the, the things that are promised and required uh, by human rights. And, and, and in many instances, we've heard very positive acceptance and agreement uh, of that from government. Certainly the Canadian government, for instance, uh, has been a strong uh, voice on the world stage, reminding governments around the world that protecting public health and protecting human rights do go hand in hand at a time like this crisis. Um, but our words enough, our good intentions uh, enough, absolutely not. Uh, and, and I think that's why this next slide is so crucial, this, this call for oversight. Uh, which, um, which Amnesty and a number of organizations, a number of uh, Nova Scotia-based groups, uh, academics at Dalhousie joined together. Uh, it's been endorsed by over 300 groups and experts now, saying to governments, you need to go beyond uh, those words and good intentions. We need oversight, enforcement and implementation if we're going to ensure, especially in a time of crisis, that what is promised when it comes to human rights is actually delivered. Uh, that's particularly vital uh, in, in the context of this particular crisis because so many of the bodies and mechanisms that we would generally rely upon for oversight and enforcement, even the courts, human rights tribunals, our parliaments, legislatures, municipal bodies, are scaled back, suspended, uh, are at best operating a, a, according to sort of an emergency schedule. And thus the need for oversight uh, is absolutely vital. We're having some very positive uh, discussions with the federal government and, and seeing some receptivity to this idea of putting something in place, hopefully sooner than later. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things that I want to highlight uh, that is absolutely a crucial part of oversight and again speaks directly to our theme today is that one of the key functions of oversight is making sure that the right information, the right statistics, the right data is being gathered and analyzed as, as policies are being developed and measures uh, rolled out. And we do that very poorly in Canada as a general rule, in particular we do not do a good job of gathering statistics that is disaggregated by race and gender and disability and indigenous and other identities, uh, which is absolutely crucial. And, and one other reason why oversight is so vital. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
Uh, and I'll end with this um, because I think it's it's really important to remind ourselves that uh, that when we're talking about where human rights fits uh, in responding to something like the COVID crisis, why it's so important, how it can make a difference, you know, what kinds of mechanisms and norms and principles and oversight processes, all of which sounds a little bit legalistic and technical. Uh, I think it's also important to remember this, uh, that at the end of the day, perhaps more important than anything, human rights uh, is all about solidarity, it's about community, it's universality, it's about connection. Uh, that's particularly vital when it comes to uh, concerns about vulnerable communities being left behind. Uh, the, the human rights message at its very core, after all, is uh, that we're all in this together. And, uh, uh, and that's always important, uh, but I think in the face of this kind of crisis, is perhaps more important than ever, uh, and certainly uh, is absolutely vital in ensuring that the needs and realities of vulnerable communities are being addressed. So thank you for that, and I will wrap it up, and uh, I guess pass it back to you, uh, Dr. Rajak Tally. <laughs> Lots of questions at the very end, but for now I'd like to pass the virtual talking stick to Dr. Judy McDonald to talk to us a little bit about the challenges persons with disabilities face in times of pandemic. Judy, are we having some technical difficulties? Ah, there we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. My presentation is Disabled People and COVID-19, Are We a Disposable People? And people with disabilities have historically been marginalized throughout society. And when societal pressure mounts, be it times of war or times of economic downturns or times of pandemics, like what we're living now with COVID-19, that the, the, the pressure, um, and the, and the concerns that get raised about people with disabilities being a disposable people or being forgotten um, and discarded uh, become grave of grave concern to all of us. Historically, all we have to do is look back to times in our past where, you know, Hitler's, um, you know, the people with disabilities were the, the first target for the purification of the race under Hitler and a quarter of a million people with disabilities were eliminated during the Nazi um, you know, regime. And, you know, people were originally gassed, um, people with disabilities. And then when there was a bit of an outcry about that, it became that they were hidden away in isolated institutions and literally starved to death, forgotten, hidden, um, out of sight, out of mind. Then, you know, we look at our own country, think, well, that's, you know, that's a long time ago, you know, we'd never do things like that. But we look at our own country, and we have a history of forced sterilization of young women, uh, girls, who had been identified as living with a disability. And, you know, in, in the province of Alberta, it's estimated that at least 3,000 young girls with disabilities were sterilized during the sterilization um, laws. And one of the most um, pronounced or, or notable people was a, a woman named Leanne Murr. And Leanne was 15 years old when the government of Alberta sent down an order to have her fallopian tubes removed to prevent her from bearing children who would be mentally defective. She was told she was going for an appendectomy. She didn't realize, this was 1959, the laws against sterilization were not removed from the books until 1972. And Leanne herself did not know what happened to her until she was married and tried to conceive and couldn't. A brave woman and, and, uh, and certainly a leader uh, in the disability community, she sued the provincial government and she was one of the first to receive compensation for wrongful sterilization. But that's not that far back in our history that acts of, of such a violation happened to, to a community of people. Modern day eugenics take place in the form of healthcare being withheld or denied uh, to disabled persons. 
you know, some work that we did through a Healthy Balance Research Project. I'll never forget, you know, talking to this one woman, a young mother who had a severely disabled son, and how she passionately told us about having to go to the hospital and having to advocate and push for healthcare providers to put a please resuscitate note on her son's chart. You know, to have to fight for, for the right for his life. I just want to refer to a quote that she shared with us. I fight for his value. I'm basically faced with their attitude of he'd probably be better off if he passed away. They asked me many times, what kind of treatment did I want? Even for things like pneumonia. So basically at any point I could choose to let him die. No questions asked. You know, that I mean, think of, of the struggle and, and, you know, just to access to adequate health care in, in a country that has socialized medicine. You know, other people with disabilities, I remember working, you know, a number of years ago when I was a medical social worker with this young girl, 17 year old who, who needed a heart lung transplant. And she had a heart of about a 90 year old. And unfortunately she also struggled with cognitive um, developmental disabilities and probably had a cognitive ability of about an eight year old. And when when an assessment got done about whether or not this young girl would, would qualify for a double transplant, there was many concerns about her social situation. She lived in poverty. She was from a rural remote community. Her mother was a stay at home mom and her dad was a seasonal worker who often in the Maritimes, that's not unfamiliar. He would rake blueberries in the summer and log in the winter. And there had been concerns about them following, you know, medical treatment regimes in the past. So the transplant team determined that there was too much risk to both the, the post and uh, the pre and post care of Deidre for her to be successful with getting a double transplant. And she did not receive the transplant. So, you know, we get into a position where, where we're making judgment on people's lives due to their perceived abilities and due to our assessment about how we think that they will do in relation to that medical treatment. You know, people, people with, with uh, disabilities, you know, it can be thought of in this pandemic as a reasonable casualty of the pandemic. That, you know, it's just one of those unfortunate things that we can't reach everybody or that we can't provide services to everybody. You know, we can't save them all is kind of the mindset. But I ask you, what has happened to, to the dignity of life, to our concepts of diversity and equity principles? You know, we have the opportunity to rewrite our history, to do things differently this time. You know, when we look to the news in the high in the, the headlines with regards to people with disabilities in the last few weeks, we read things such as out of the on March 23rd, out of the NPR paper in Washington State. There came, you know, people with disabilities are rationing care policies violate their civil rights. You know, we go on to read on April 6th from CT CTV London, some CT, excuse me, LTC drivers refuse passengers with, in wheelchairs. On April 13th from the Toronto Star, activists fear for safety of people with disabilities after funding for mobility and medical devices is deemed non-essential. On April 15th, the Windsor Star, parents worry their disabled children will, will, will get low priority during COVID-19. And this is in particularly related to, to Premier Ford's secret protocol for rationing medical care during the crisis. On April 19th, CBC, assessing the value of life, COVID-19 triers must work against those with, are, mustn't work against those with disabilities. Governments need to affirm ethical and human rights obligations to persons with disabilities. Nancy Hansen is an associate professor and director of disability studies at the University of Manitoba. And she writes, quote, 
how quickly we move from a society that values diversity and inclusion to the point where different to the point where difficult decisions will have to be made end of quote there are over 6 million people in canada that live with a disability covid-19 will hit people with disabilities the hardest you know we have to look at what their experiences have been and continue to be within our society. And maybe it's time we learned a bit from people with disabilities. People with disabilities face social isolation on a daily basis, long before COVID-19 came along. We're all in society getting a little taste of what that experience is like. But for them, it's something that they deal with on a daily basis, not going outside or having restricted restricted exposure to the social environments, not having transportation to go to the movies or to engage in, in some form of social life. In this province, you access a bus, you have to book it a week in advance and it's primarily reserved for, for medical appointments. You know, we, we, you know we, we need to be able to, to understand the experiences of people with disabilities. You know, one woman goes on to say, I used to not, I'm used to not being touched much. What kind of society do we live in if that's the case? Another person with disability talks about how now we turn away from people. We don't greet people on the streets. We turn our heads. We distance ourselves from them. She said, that, that's my life before COVID-19. I'm, I'm, I'm invisible to people. People look over me. They don't make eye contact with me. You know, people, a blind person talked about how do you now, how does he now navigate going to a grocery store? He used to hold on to a person's arm. And by doing that, he would, he would get to understand his whole environment by their movements and their gestures. And now he uses a white cane, which doesn't have the same detailed tactile um, relay system for him. You know, people with disabilities fear that they're going to get sick, that they're, that if they get sick and have to go to hospital or have to find a testing site, how are they going to get there? Because they're told not to take public transportation if they have any symptoms, and that's their only mode of transportation. You know, Sarah Trick lives with cerebral palsy and relies on caregivers for assistance with activities of daily living, and she is fearful that she's not, that her workers are not going to show up or that her hours will be reduced. You know, this quote was striking to me. She said, if I contract COVID-19, I may or may not die. If I lose access to care, I will definitely die. People with disabilities are vulnerable right now. They're fearing that their exposure to COVID-19 is increased by caregivers coming in and out of the home, but their greater fear is that the caregivers won't come at all. Most, you know, of, of, uh, of most of the deaths related to COVID-19 are happening from nursing homes. 79% of COVID-19 deaths have occurred in nursing homes. A great deal of people with disabilities are housed in nursing homes or other residential facilities. This makes them part of that vulnerable population. Mental health disabilities, we think of people that, all of us now, you know, we have increased worry, we have sleeplessness, we have a feeling down, feeling anxious. Think about people living with mental health disabilities and how in their normal life, it's 10 times what we're experiencing right now. All in all, I think we have a lot to learn from people with disabilities. When COVID-19 is over, I hope we step back and think about where we're at as a society. I hope we take a deep look into how we were made to feel isolated and how that is the lived reality of people with disabilities on a daily basis. I hope it's now time for society to truly become accessible. Thank you. Donna, I particularly enjoyed the presentation because data presents one depiction, but the case studies and the personal narratives that you shared with us humanizes the data. I'm also deeply honored and humbled to work with Dr. McDonald at Dalhousie because she does a good job in keeping the disabled group core and center to equity, diversity, and inclusiveness.
Yes. So thank you. Thank you. I would like now to move on to another distinguished, honored um, colleague, Dr. Ingrid Waldron, who will speak to us a little bit about the, how the pandemic is impacting African Canadians. And after Dr. Waldron speaks, we'll go to the Q&A. So Ingrid, the talking stick is with you. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, so what I wanna talk about is uh, why race matters when we talk about uh, the pandemic. Uh, since the COVID-19 pandemic hit the United States, evidence has been emerging that it has been affecting more African-Americans and that this may be due to the fact uh, that they are racialized communities and low-income communities that are dealing with various social determinants of health. And they are, the evidence is suggesting that they are certainly dying at higher rates than uh, white Americans. Uh, so the social determinants of health that I'm uh, referring to are race, of course, gender identity, uh, sexual orientation and disability. So I think it's important to have an intersectional analysis to look at how uh, uh, these issues shape risk or exposure uh, to the pandemic, uh, to the virus. Many in the African Nova Scotian community are now wondering if they too will be disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, given the long-standing social, economic, and health inequalities they experience. There's an urgency in determining if the community as a whole, I'm talking about the African Nova Scotian community, will be disproportionately impacted in light of comments made by Nova Scotia's chief medical officer of health during a press conference that the Prestons is a hotspot where there is community spread of COVID-19. The Prestons include the communities of Cherry Brook, Lake Loon, East Preston and North Preston. Since late March, the COVID-19 Preston response team has opened three testing sites in the Prestons. The team, which is comprised of community organizations, clinicians, local clergy and activist groups is taking a grassroots approach to working with Preston residents and public health officials. Uh, next slide, please. So in this presentation, what I'd like to do is to examine how race provides an important analytical entry point for understanding and addressing the multiple social, economic, environmental, and political factors that create disproportionate exposure to the virus, and also make an argument for why the pandemic provides a perfect opportunity for the provincial and federal governments to begin collecting disaggregated data based on race, along with other social identifiers, such as gender identity, sexual orientation, and disability. Next slide, please. A recent New York Times article found that African Americans and low income groups and women are more at risk for infection from COVID-19 because they are disproportionately located in essential services jobs that pay low wages, such as custodian staff, personal care workers, licensed practical uh, nursing, et cetera, uh, personal uh, support workers that make it less likely for them to be able to work from home or engage in social physical distancing and more likely to use public transportation for work and therefore more likely to come into contact with the public. Similarly, the disproportionate location of African Nova Scotians in low income, essential services jobs, as well as the legacy of racism, sexism, classism, colonialism, and intergenerational income insecurity and poverty in their community means that they will be more exposed to the social determinants that put them at risk for the virus. Intergenerational income insecurity and poverty also mean that African Nova Scotians are more likely to live in households with large multi-generational families making it less likely for them to isolate or quarantine sick family members in separate bedrooms or to use separate bathrooms. There are also concerns in the community that infection from the virus will exacerbate other long-standing health disparities in the African Nova Scotian community that result from a legacy of racism and other structural inequalities. And as many of us know, um, African Nova Scotians and Indigenous communities in Nova Scotia and Canada suffer higher rates of various uh, illnesses. So there certainly is that concern that the virus uh, would exacerbate uh, those longstanding health disparities. Therefore, in determining why the Prestons has become a hotspot for community spread of the virus, 
It's important to examine how racism and other intersecting social determinants of health and longstanding structural inequities create exposure to and risk for infection from COVID-19 and also influence access to COVID-19 testing, health services, treatment, and other supports for Preston residents. Next slide, please. Research conducted over the last several years point to several structural inequities contributing uh, to health disparities and mental health disparities in African Nova Scotian communities, including institutional racism, socioeconomic disparities, educational barriers, and environmental racism. These health and mental health disparities result in high rates of stress, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, cancer, and respiratory illness in African Nova Scotian communities. Conversations are also taking place about the mental health impacts of the pandemic, particularly how social distancing has exacerbated feelings of powerlessness, fear, anxiety, and stress. For African Nova Scotians in the Prestons and across the province who continue to deal with the legacy of post-traumatic stress disorder resulting from racism and other structural inequities, the mental health impacts of the pandemic will be particularly harmful because once again, it may exacerbate long-standing mental health issues in this community. Next slide, please. So I have a few recommendations. I wanna offer a few suggestions for how Preston residents, the health system, the government, public health officials, community leaders, community-based organizers, organizations, and researchers can help to reduce community spread of the virus in the Prestons. First, there's a need to call on the provincial and federal governments to collect disaggregated health data based on race, and other social determinants of health, which will determine if and how the virus is impacting African Nova Scotians in the Prestons and Black communities and other parts of the province and country, as well as identify rates of COVID-19 infection in these communities across gender, age, income, education, disability, employment, uh, housing and living arrangement categories. Next, it needs to support the work, or we need to support the work, and public health officials need to support the work that's already being carried out by the COVID-19 Preston response team that I discussed earlier, which I mentioned has set up uh, three sites so far in the Prestons and is creating awareness in the community about the virus and the importance of getting tested. Third, it's important to conduct studies to identify and address the social determinants of health that create exposure to and risk for COVID-19 infection in the Prestons and other black communities. I am pleased to report that I found out yesterday evening that a grant that I submitted with a team uh, in the Faculty of Health and Medicine has been awarded um, a grant to look at culturally specific COVID-19 uh, response strategies for African Nova Scotians in the Prestons. Um, and we also have a few graduate students on board. The research is being funded by the Nova Scotia COVID-19 Health Research Coalition, which includes Dalhousie University, the Dalhousie Medical Research Foundation, Nova Scotia Health Authority, QE2 Foundation, IWK Foundation, Dartmouth General Hospital Foundation, and Research Nova Scotia. So that's a total of $75,000 that we are going to be using to, uh, um, to examine the issue from a mixed methods approach, including surveys and focus groups and interviews in the Preston community. And we're gonna start that research uh, right away starting next week, we will have our first meeting. So I'm very excited about that. So once again, research is really important. Um, uh, fourth, it's important to determine how clinical services and health promotion approaches can use a social determinants of health framework to improve access to COVID-19 testing and health, servicing, health services among Preston residents and other racialized communities in the province. Also important, identify 
government and community supports and resources needed to address the social, economic, health, and mental health impacts of the pandemic in the Prestons. We also need to use the pandemic as an opportunity to increase the education, training, recruitment, and employment of African Nova Scotians and other people of African descent at all levels of the health system, which would enhance health services utilization among this population group and other racialized groups. Important to collaborate with the Preston response team to develop a template or model for a culturally specific pandemic response strategy for the Prestons that would better equip residents to navigate the health and mental health systems, access testing and community resources and supports, uh, supports like um, emergency housing and financial help, and also to help them address future health emergencies in the Prestons. And finally, we need to use that template as a model to develop culturally specific pandemic response strategies for other racialized and marginalized communities in Nova Scotia across Canada and globally. And this is what I'm hoping would result from the funded research uh, that we're going to begin starting next week. I'd like to thank you for listening. So please submit your questions for presenters in the comment section. Um, as they appear on the screen. Okay. Uh, Kevin has one there. It's a heavy emphasis on technology such as vaccines, smartphone, tracing apps, et cetera, crowd, crowding out the dialogue of important social determinants of health related to COVID, or is it elevating these issues? Anybody could start. Um, did you get the question? Um, Ingrid, would you like to start us off? Um, yeah, so she's wondering if there's been a focus more on technology, technology. social yeah. determinants of health. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's always an, an emphasis on the medical model. Uh, we tend to um, we tend to see illness always as um, emanating from inside the body rather than outside the body, rather than externally. And we know now in Canada and the rest of the world that the social determinants of health uh, plays the largest factor in our health and well-being. So we need to start to have conversations more and more about the social, economic, political, and environmental factors um, that impact health. Certainly there's always a place, of course, for technology and, and discussions about vaccines and smartphones, but I know from the work that I and others have done in the Black community and other communities that uh, their health issues, their mental health issues, a result from structural issues, the structural inequities within employment, labor, housing, criminal justice. Um, so. Uh, and this is the focus of the grant that I mentioned, that I want to focus on those social determinants of health. So while I'm also going to look at um, more, what we call medical issues, uh, there's going to be an emphasis in my work on the social determinants of, of health. And what is, is encouraging to me is that I was funded, that our team was funded, and our team 
are made up of social scientists and individuals who are much more focused on the determinants of health uh, than technology. So it is, mm -hmm. for me, it tells me that there's hope um, that the health system um, is coming around um, and understanding that these are the issues that have actually the most bearing on health. And that if we don't get those issues right, if we don't address inequities within our social system, um, then it's going to be very difficult to address the health disparities in our marginalized populations, indigenous populations, and black populations here in Nova Scotia and in Canada. Yeah. Um, but Judy or Alex want to jump in there? Excellent question, Kevin. Thanks. I, I mean, I think that that you know, it's going to take a vaccine to have people with disabilities feel like they're really protected um, and to, to, but what I'm truly hoping is that the, and, and, you know, even the focus of my presentation is that the stories of people's experiences is going to touch people and that we're going to start to have a different understanding about the social determinants of health. You know, we need Technology can be an assistance to us. It can also be a hindrance. I mean, there's grave concern about about tracking people um, and and their whereabouts through cell phones uh, around this COVID nineteen experience um, in other countries. But you know, I I think that we have the opportunity in this country to to really define how we want healthcare to look like and how we want our social networks to feed into that aspect of health. Alex, jump in. Uh, well, I think I think Ingrid and Judy have, have, have uh, answered it uh, powerfully. I think it is an incredibly important question. And, and I do agree with the premise of the question. Uh, I, I think you know, none of us would disagree that that measures like rapid development of a vaccine, um, and uh, and some of the the technological steps that are that are being used to try to slow down or avert spread of the virus are are important. Those are all short term measures, uh, but um, but if uh, if that does crowd out the space, uh, or if we don't make sure we're opening up the space for this vitally important conversation around social determinants uh, of health, around the, the racism and the ableism and, uh, and the other deep rooted concerns uh, around colonialism uh, that, that are so central to that. Um, both uh, right now, as we're continuing even uh, with the immediate um, crisis response phase, but very significantly as we start to come out of the crisis um, and are going to be faced with, with a window of time which will probably be short-lived in which uh, some of the impetus for reform and transformation because of everything that has been so laid bare, uh, I think to all Canadians, uh, that has been a reality for communities for a long time. Uh, but, uh, but we will have a moment in which we can really be pushing for that transformative reform agenda. And that's all about these kinds of concerns. Uh, and so we need to keep that space open. Yeah. Well, thank you. I see we have another uh, question on screen. Um, question reads, how can we become advocates for vulnerable communities in a meaningful way during this time of self-isolation? Thank you for this question. Um, Folks, please jump in before I do. <laughs> well, I, I'll just start real, real simply. That um, I think there's, there's, there's two ways that I would go about this. One is to connect with with communities that have an organization. So you know, reach out to the Council of Canadians with Disabilities. Reach out to, you know, the Mental Health Association in your local community. Find ways that you can connect with with groups of people with disabilities that are vulnerable right now. But on a more personal, in your own community level, you know, if there's somebody in your community that has a disability that could potentially be in a vulnerable position, check in on them, you know? Ask them if they need the help getting their groceries or if there's anything that you can do to be a community partner. Um, so that's just my response. I, I agree that it's important. Hey. Yeah, I agree. I agree it's important to connect with 
communities uh, through organizations that support those communities. So when I think of the black community specifically, I talked earlier about the Preston response team. Um, I think supporting uh, what they're doing, which is fantastic work is crucial, uh, but also through them, the Black Social Workers Association yeah. uh, here in Halifax and the Health Association of African Canadians are all part of that response team um, in the Preston. So I think the connections through organizations to serve communities are great. I think one of the best things that anybody can do in terms of advocating for the Black community is to call on the government uh, to start collecting disaggregated race-based data. As the Black community, we have been calling on this for decades. Mm -hmm. And we think that this pandemic, I mean, it should have happened long, a long time ago, but this pandemic is actually a perfect opportunity um, uh, for that data to be collected because aren't we seeing um, more than perhaps any other time how those disparities are playing out and why it's revealing to us everything that many of us who are teaching about the social determinants of health have been saying. Now we've gotten, you know, the proof that it's happening mm -hmm. in different ways. It's in front of us. In a very different way. So I think for the Black community in, in Ontario and in Nova Scotia and other parts of Canada who have been calling on the federal and provincial governments to collect data based on race, I think the best way that you can support these communities is to um, to support those voices who have been calling for that. We cannot address the issues unless we know what's happening. And collecting data is going to tell us what's happening. So we continue to keep a, have a blind eye towards, towards racial differences in this country. We will never be able to address uh, the health disparities that racialized communities in particular uh, suffer from. And perhaps that's, perhaps that's the idea. People, the government doesn't want to know, perhaps. Right? So I would say right now for the black community, this is the most important issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have an observation that I would like people to comment on. And um, we are all seeing this on the TV screens all throughout Canada and North America. I find it interesting that the same populations that we are talking about, the marginalized and the vulnerable, are the ones on the front line are the first responders, you know, and, and the, the offsprings of this group are also in the laboratories, the doctors, the medical scientists. Um, can, can you, have you seen similar observations? What do we make of this? I, I, I could go first here. I think that's a, that's a very important uh, observation, and and I think it often gets left out of of the you know the narrative that is out there in these difficult times of um, of how we're all um, at home and connecting up and uh, creating you know online communities and being supportive of each other. Um, leave that out uh, of the equation the the fact that what it is to be home or not at home right now is very different uh, depending on a whole host of uh, considerations but very much including you know where you are in society um, and uh, i think that observation um teresa that um that there is, I, I haven't seen sort of clear and definitive statistics, but I think anecdotally and impressionistically, we all know uh, that in particular, some of the the the, um, the professions, you think of personal support workers in long-term care facilities, for instance, you know, overwhelmingly uh, women from refugee and immigrant uh, backgrounds um, and, uh, you know, facing incredible risks and the, you know, the wonderful world of everyone's at home uh, baking bread and singing songs to each other is not there. COVID pandemic reality. Uh, there's a very urgent human rights reality that I think um, number one, governments were a bit too slow uh, to take seriously and respond to. We are seeing some better measures from governments now. Uh, but if that doesn't become part of the, the, the long-term transformative reform agenda coming out of this crisis, uh, then we should all be deeply ashamed of ourselves. The other, the other point that I'd like to connect into Alex is, is the issue that home is not 
that safe place for everybody. That, that, that there's a lot of people that home has, and isolation has increased um, their concerns for safety as in issues around gender-based violence and women abuse and child abuse. Um, so we, we, you know, we've got to, how we perceive home to be, uh, I think has to be a broader concept. Uh, in just terms of Thank the you guys. I've always got Ingrid. Yeah, just in terms of the economic issues, you know. Do you want to have the final? There's this term called. Uh, oh, should I go ahead or no? Oh, there's a term. Yeah, we have. Uh, we are wrapping up now. But you have the final word. No, that's that's okay. I'm good. Go ahead, Ingrid. <laughs> oh, I'm just saying. There's a term called job ghetto. Um, <laughs> There's a term called job ghetto. I mean, um, immigrant, immigrant women and racialized women, racialized immigrant okay. women tend to be located disproportionately in job ghetto. So yes, th those are the people who are on the front lines. We see that in the United States. It's a fact in Canada. We know from Statistics Canada from 2017 that African Nova Scotians have lower wages in other communities and tend to be in these types of jobs. So yes, it is the case that they would be on the front lines um of the pandemic um and at risk for exposure so um i agree with alex that's certainly at the case and there are statistics statistics canada 2017 that indicates uh the types of jobs that african nova scotians tend to be located in and their income which is much lower than other groups in nova scotia okay Right. Stay in tune. Teresa, are we losing you? Um, so I think they're, they're asking us uh, to wrap up <laughs> the session. So uh, I'll just start by, by saying uh, I, I uh, thank everybody for, for, for coming and listening in to us today. It was great uh, sharing the space with, with, with Ingrid and Alex both. Um, and, uh, you know, I think these conversations are only beginning to, to, to start to happen. And I think we need to continue with the dialogue. So Ingrid. Yes, I'd just like to thank everyone for attending and for my co-presenters. I agree. We need to have deeper conversations uh, about these issues. And I'm hoping uh, that's going to happen. Even when things yeah. get back to so-called normal, we have to make sure that we continue to have these conversations. Yeah, absolutely. Alec, do you have anything? And, and I'll echo. Sure, I'll echo, uh, firstly, the, the appreciation, what an honor it was to, to be together with Judy and Ingrid for this session. And I guess if, if there's anything I would want um, our audience to, to take from this, it is to, to hold on to the reflections, recommendations and concerns uh, that we've discussed over this, um, this past hour, not just in the short term, uh, not just in the coming weeks and months as we continue to face the crisis and, and do have government and media attention around a whole variety of issues. Uh, obviously, we do want to make sure that the particular um, realities faced by marginalized and vulnerable communities in the crisis time is front and center during those upcoming weeks and months, but equally, and perhaps in many respects, even more crucial uh, is that long-term view uh, that, uh, you know, as, as, as I think Ingrid or Judy just said, we just don't slip back to, you know, the new normal being the old normal, uh, yeah. that if we don't affect some meaningful change that addresses the disgraceful inequities, long known and long existing, uh, 
but perhaps in some respects now much more um, apparent in a very raw way uh, to to all Canadians uh, than uh, than we have lost an incredibly important opportunity to advance some really meaningful social justice change. Absolutely. And I finally, I, in saying goodbye, I also want to thank our interpreter. Job well done. Thank you.